we are ready to go. And so let me start by saying thank you all for being here. Welcome. Um, and um, my name is Vincent. I am the Maddie's Director for the Human Animal Support Services Project, uh, otherwise known as Haas. Um, and um, let me review a few housekeeping items before we get started on tonight's webinar. So I'm going to read directly from, from my notes. In Zoom, you'll, you will see a Q&A option at the, at the bottom next to the chat option. Please use the Q&A to submit any questions you have for the panelists to ensure we see your questions. Also, use, uh, use the chat to engage throughout the presentation. We ask that you stay on topic in the chat. In order to chat with each other, please use the, bl the blue drop down in your chat box and switch it to everyone. And make sure you have that everyone because the only way for all of the, the all, everybody here to see it is, is, is everyone. There's certain times when the host and panelist is chosen and that's the only people that can see your question sometimes. Um, now, also let me back up on the Q&A. Make sure you, if you have any questions, uh, comments put in the chat, but any questions, please put in the Q&A. That way we can track it. And we also, I will re read the questions and make sure your question gets answered during this webinar. Also, please stay tuned to fill out a brief poll at the very end of the webinar. And then lastly, a recording of this webinar will be distributed within three business days uh, to the email you registered with. And if you do not see it in your inbox within three business days, please be sure to check your spam or to visit our website. That is haas.org. All right, now let me introduce um, tonight's topic and panelists. We have two people that I have known for quite a while um, and I'm very happy that they are here. Two experts in the industry on, in tonight's webinar is called All About Transport, Moving Animals to Create Lasting Positive Impact. And we will have we have the opportunity to speak to two experts, as I said, the director of national operations for Austin Pets Alive, uh, Claire Callison, and Lindsay Hamrick, who is the director of shelter outreach and engagement for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and I'm going to we're going to start by inviting the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Lindsay, and give us a little background and how you. Um, what led you to, to transport being one of the things that you are uh, so focused on nationally? Well, first, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. This is such a critical conversation um, and has been for over a decade now, um, and it continues to evolve. Uh, my background, I've been with HSUS about 10 years now, which seems a little crazy. Um, and in my role as director of shelter outreach, I'm receiving pretty constant requests about how do we move animals in a more efficient way? How do we help more animals? And uh, my passion for this really started when I worked in animal shelters before I came to HSUS. Uh, I was in charge of operations at a few of the shelters here in New Hampshire, which is where I live. And so uh, I have been on sort of the receiving shelter dynamic for a long time. Um, and I'm part of the New England Federation of Humane Societies Board, so we're constantly talking about New England's role in this um, topic, and I think it's changed a lot over the years, and I'm just excited to keep the conversation going so we can do the best with uh, the challenges that we're facing now. Thank you, Lindsay. And how about you, Claire? Hi, everyone. And yeah, just echoing Lindsay. Thanks, everyone, for ending their evening with us, uh, depending on your time zone. Thanks for, for tuning in and being here. Um, I started my career actually working at the same organization, uh, gosh, I think 12, 13 years ago now uh, with Vincent in uh, the city of San Antonio, the animal care services. And I, like a lot of people, I think, stumbled into transport. I, there was not really a guidebook um, on how to do it. I don't think I knew what I was doing to start with, but it really came um, starting a program and starting transporting really came out of necessity. Um, at the time that Vincent and I were working, the shelter had a, a 30,000, over 30,000 animal intake. So very high volume and um, unfortunately low life-saving rate when we when we first started there. So, um, you know, it was really out of necessity and reaching out to 
groups all over the country that I had no connection with and just sort of throwing it together. Um, and then fast forward to today, I've seen a lot of ways and we'll get into it that um, transport can be improved. And um, uh, I've started a program in Austin Pets Alive where we serve as a uh, basically a transport hub focusing on Texas shelters that are under-resourced and don't have the ability really to um, handle all the medical costs or the logistics and the actual transportation piece. So we serve as the, um, the missing piece of, of that. So like Lindsay is uh, representing more of the destination side, um, I have more experience on the, on the source shelter side. So happy to be here. All right, so we'll start with you, Lindsay. So your work at HSUS, um, you work on with organizations um, the, in your capacity building mentorship program. Talk to us a little bit about where does um, transport, how does that tie into the program success? So what I think I want to say from a big picture perspective is HSUS has spent a lot of time, as I know many of you have, really thinking about what is our role? How can we not duplicate efforts where things are working well, but maybe offer some uh, focused strategy in areas where there's some opportunity? And so we have a mentorship program uh, that we've been doing for the last three years. It's called the Capacity Building Mentorship. It comes with $15,000 in grant funding. And the concept is that an organization that is able to receive animals is building relationships with usually county or under-resourced shelters in their region, possibly just in their, their general neighborhood, um, to work on best practices, to have long-term relationships that are built so that when that shelter that has no funding, has very limited staff, all the other challenges that we see um, is facing a crisis, they have someone that's a little bit more local to reach out to. And I think this kind of... Um, hub and spoke model is something that a lot of us are, are looking at. It doesn't mean that the relationships that are sort of across the country, the you know Florida organization that's working with a Massachusetts shelter, that there's anything wrong with that. But within our capacity building mentorship, we really want it to be holistic and for transport to be a component of that. Um, we've worked with uh, organizations like the Humane Society of Charlotte, North Central Florida, uh, we're currently working with Good Shepherd Humane Society in Arkansas and Humane Indiana in Indiana. Um, and those organizations, they were already working to lift up local organizations before our mentorship. But for a year, we all spend time together kind of troubleshooting what are the variety of things that we can offer to those organizations to strengthen them. The mentorship includes other things like training for law enforcement and, and animal control, because often these organizations are municipal or county-based. Um, but I think all of them would report that the movement of animals is not only one of the ways to build a positive relationship with another organization, but it's also really difficult to go to a shelter that's struggling and to say, hey, do all these best practices and all these medical protocols and all these things that we all wish we could do if they have so many animals that they can't breathe. And so moving animals out for us is not just about those individual animals, which is important. It's also about giving them some breathing room so that they can maybe go to Animal Care Expo or learn something that they never had an opportunity to be exposed to. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like you really want to um, put the human being as part of that equation to the person working in the shelter because um, it's, you know, it's not all about animals, right? It's it's also about people too. That's right. And I would say too, as a national organization, we can't be everywhere, nor should we be. The communities understand their own challenges. And if we were constantly the ones kind of maintaining people's relationships, whether about transport or otherwise, we miss this really critical piece, which is about the people on the ground really knowing their shelter that's next door or within their same county or state. And so we we don't take a fully hands-off approach because we want to offer expertise and funding, but um, our goal is that after the year is done, folks just continue on and they they move forward with the plans that they have set in place. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay. So Claire, talk to us a little bit about the you you have built transport programs from the ground up. Um, 
What are some key steps um, and some challenges involved in starting programs like these? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest things that comes up, and I, I think this is a continuous journey, you haven't solved it, you know, once you solve it once, I think it keeps, that question keeps coming up, but it's the balance between um, local efforts versus uh, more transport efforts. So, um, you know, and we were just talking before the call, but really it's important to acknowledge that we understand more than ever now that transport is being challenged and groups are really struggling out there um, to find partners, the, you know, transport numbers are down and, um, you know, to me, it's really uh, an example of, you know, the balance or the importance of balancing the local options such as um, adoption and foster and return to owner live outcomes. Um, and it's important to even start questioning, you know, animals coming in in the first place, right? Like preventative programs um, that prevent them from coming into the first, in the shelters in the first place. So it's balancing those efforts um, with transport and, and so often I see organizations um, really putting all their eggs in the transport basket and really relying on that, um, but that's not always sustainable or the answer. And I think we've really felt it this year um, as the, the importance of balancing those local efforts. Um, you know, I think on the source and the destination side, communication has been a real big challenge. Um, sorry, streamlining communication and um, making sure that, you know, two organizations are working efficiently together and um, being transparent with communication. Um, I think that that's been always a, a tricky piece of it. And then networking with each other and, and finding partnerships, that's that's been a struggle too. So, um, you know, I I think just really looking at transport as just one tool of many in our, in our toolbox is just such an important piece of this. And we always have to revisit that when we're looking at our transport programs. So you mentioned that um, the, um, and this is for both of you, but but you mentioned it, Claire, and um, that, um, you know, transport is not the, you know, not the, uh, not a one size fits all solution. Um, how do you how do you see the um, transport evolving, and what do you see the future of it being? Considering the amount of work you you're currently doing, both and this is for both of you, you Lindsay and uh, Claire. Um, yeah, so the current state, and then like, what do you see as a future for it and its evolution? Um, I'm happy to take the, the first stab at that. Um, so, you know, I would say that we, it's really important to reflect on, of course, all the positive things that transport brings, but where we've got it wrong and some of the, the negative aspects that have happened. And, and I don't see that as being, you know, pessimistic by any means, but it gives us opportunities of what we can improve in the future. Um, you know, one of the things from, you know, a destination partner standpoint, and I, and I think Lindsay will echo this, is I think organizations are really coming to question, you know, are we duplicating efforts and are we moving dogs from um, historically, like generally southern regions or um, different parts of the country that are struggling to organize to other areas of the country where they would have been safe anyway, um, where they were. And if we would only invest, you know, more uh, resources and, um, you know, more resources to help people keep their pets, do we really need to be transporting them completely across the country, right? And so we've been operating in that model of moving sort of um, the puppies and smaller dogs and things, um, which is definitely, there's value to that. And I'm not taking that away, but I think that there is some ability to really look into that practice and see, you know, if they already have a home, is it is it truly rescue if we're, if we're moving them, you know, across the country? So I think destination partners might be looking into that more as well as source shelters. Um, um, but, you know, we also, one of the things that I want to make sure that we talk about is, you know, transport should never be viewed as a way to move animals from a 
quote, less desirable area to a more desirable region of the country, thinking that, you know, saying adopters in Texas are, are, are all bad, right? I mean, that there's a lot of discrimination around that and this just very problematic way of looking at transport. So, um, you know, the evolution to answer that other piece of that question, what I hope to see and what I am seeing more and more is that transport is seen um, as more is less transactional and more built on collaboration and true partnership. Um, I've seen that with groups that are sending down supplies, are visiting each other, are um, investing into local solutions to help source shelters get to the root of the problem. Um, and I love that transport could just be seen as a way to, A, of course, save lives and, and move uh, animals from a, an area of high population to an area where um, there might be more room for adoption, um, but also as a way to give breathing room to build in some more of those um, more sustainable programming um, into source shelters. But it's hard to ever think about, uh, you know, uh, improving your shelter operations when you're just you know, drowning every day and, and constantly over capacity and, and dealing with high numbers of intake coming in. So that's a long winded answer, but I would love to see it uh, move more and what I do see it moving more into collaboration and true partnership versus just a transaction between two organizations. Thank you. Um, I would echo all of that. I think the, the thing that I'm really interested in right now is this juggling of so many different programs and ways that shelters and rescues are trying to support pets and, and families and the pets that are coming into organizations. And I think we all feel this real heaviness about how much there is that we could be doing and the, the stress and fatigue that comes from that. What I'm optimistic about is all of these really great ideas about keeping pets with their, their families, getting more lost pets home. I do think we are going to reach a tipping point where all of those programs start to really come together in different regions and the volume of animals in the shelters go down naturally. And so then transport becomes about something entirely different if it, if it sticks around after we get through sort of this really chaotic phase. and. If I could get everybody in a room to talk about one thing, it would be us all being honest about the different motivators for transport and holding each of them at the same level of importance. And so, for example, in states that tend to be the destination shelters, there is a constant tension about do we use these donor dollars, our staff time, available space to grow our owner support programs and other you know, ways that we can support our local animals, or do we help holistically another community, whether it's a county away or many states away? And there's no right answer to that, which is why everyone's trying to do everything. And it's so difficult when you are talking to people from another shelter or you're talking to community members to make any kind of objective decision about where you're going to really focus your efforts. Um, to be honest, it's one of the main reasons I left sheltering 10 years ago is that the shelter I was at um, was incredible. We had a lot of really cool programs, but we were simultaneously debating opening the first spay neuter clinic in the state, uh, starting a, a Pets for Life-esque program, expanding our transport programs. I mean, we were trying to do everything and the decisions that were ultimately made, made weren't wrong. They just weren't in alignment with where I felt like we could really make the most good. Um, and I don't wanna go on too much of a tangent about like more challenging animals and highly adoptable animals. But one of the tricky things is that if you're in a community where many of the local animals have behavioral and medical needs, and you're hearing from a sending organization that has animals who would just fly into adoptive homes, that is a morally very difficult decision to make if you have to choose between the two. And I, I think that receiving shelters, especially right now with staffing shortages and vet shortages and whatnot are trying to be as strategic as possible without leaving behind all of the communities that have come to depend on them to receive the animals from those communities. And uh, I don't envy all of you trying to make those decisions, but hopefully by talking about it, we can get to some of these, you know, these stressors that we're feeling. Thank you. 
So you, the two of you uh, touched on um, the idea that, you know, a lot of what transport is about is collaboration and um, work between different communities and within the community. Uh, can you give us some examples of um, on how animal transport has helped strengthen community bonds and what the other positive impacts there uh, the program has? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say I know it's not feasible for everyone and um, to be able to do this, but one of the most beneficial things that I've seen and I've I've personally experienced is the ability to visit each other and to go actually see it because it's amazing how many emails fly back and forth between organizations when it comes to transport logistics uh, for all of you on the call that have uh, been doing transport you know how many email threads go back and forth and spreadsheets and it's amazing you could be you have a partner in another state or another region that you've been talking to and working with for years, but you've never actually met them. You've never seen their face. And um, even if we financially can't afford to, to visit each other, having a Zoom call or some other way to make a personal connection, I've seen really go a long way. Um, you know, I, I there is a tendency for, you know, say a shelter is under resourced and is the one asking for help. Um, there seems to be a dynamic that naturally kind of can happen where the, the organization giving the help is sort of calls the shots and is supposed to, you know, have all the knowledge and um, there's a power dynamic there. But I think it's important that by seeing each other as people and really connecting to the to the person at the shelter, um, there's learning that goes both ways. Um, I think we all can acknowledge there's a scrappiness that comes when you are uh, have 20 dogs and not enough space to, to not enough kennel to put them in right and and more coming right behind them um, there's some real innovation that comes when you're faced with problems like that and for organizations that that isn't their daily reality there's a lot of learning that can be done on both sides of that so um anytime that we can make a connection whether it's more frequent check-ins with your with your regular transport partners it could be a phone call or a zoom um if you can somehow yeah visit each other i think that's great and really doing more listening. Um, I've, you know, I've reflected on this before, but starting a new partner call and it's just a list of criteria for transport versus actually asking the question and say, tell me a little bit about your organization and how long have you been there? And what are some of the struggles that you all are, you know, are you all encountering? I think that's a better way to start a partnership, but before, you know, before sending this transport criteria of how many vaccinations and heartworm tests and, you know, all of that, um, you know, that, that to me, from what I've seen, um, those are the most, uh, fruitful partnerships that have really, um, been the most successful. And I think more, more rewarding on both sides. I think one thing that stands out to me about transport relationships that are rooted in human beings talking to one another, I remember, and this was like 20 years ago. Our first transport partner was a Kentucky rescue, which was out of someone's home. She had some kennels um, where she took in dogs and we drove down there just to kind of meet and get to know one another. And about a year later, she, we invited her up to our uh, fundraising event, which was about raising money for this partnership. And when everyone met her and the like volunteers that were helping her, we gutted so much of the language that we had been using. We never, we no longer said that we were pulling from a kill rescue. We didn't say that we rescued these animals from her rescue because we didn't, she was the one that did the work. And then we just got a van and moved them up North. So um, it really shifts the perspective. And I remember she reported, you know, she drives down this driveway to the shelter that was this beautiful, I think it was maybe three years old at the time, the, the building. And she was just astounded at what an animal shelter could look like in a community where, you know, there had been uh, sustainability and the ability to raise funds and really work on those issues. And, and now her community is like light years ahead. And it's just so beautiful to see organizations go from one uh, part of the spectrum to the other over the course of many years of really hard work and support. And to Claire's point about this, this weird and discriminatory terminology about moving animals from one part of the country to a quote unquote better part of the country, 
that came up quite a bit from our donors back 20 years ago when we were moving these animals from Kentucky to New Hampshire. And it took a lot of conversations with folks to remind them that the problems in Kentucky were about access to spay neuter while we had a visiting veterinarian who did spay neuter all the time. Um, it was about so much more than whether or not there were adoptive homes available. And so being able to really look at the language we use in animal welfare because we're making relationships outside of our states is, is probably one of the biggest pros in my opinion. All right, well, thank you. So we're gonna take a few audience questions. Um, and um, the first one is from Sherry Grounds. Many of, of our rescues have slowed or stopped accepting transfers. How do we build a relationship with rescues that already have established transfer partners? Lindsay, do you want to start or I can? It's up to you. Either way, it's such an easy question. I'm sure you have a very fast answer to this. <laughs> no, you can you go, go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. What I would say is I wish that the availability of places to send animals was matching or even outmatching the amount of requests that come through. Um, this isn't answering your question, but one thing that I have seen is that the organizations that have heavily focused on removing adoption barriers and don't need to utilize transport as much are the ones who seem to be doing okay during this period of time where receiving organizations just cannot take on either new partners or frankly, maintain the volume of animals that they were maintaining with their existing partners. Um, also, your approach to reaching out to organizations and building relationships, like just learn more about why, because the why may be a six month delay that they need to get back on their feet. Maybe they have a bunch of staffing shortages. I know in New England, transports uh, continue to be stalled because of the veterinary shortage. And so they had been used to receiving animals with a variety of medical challenges or who needed to be spayed and neutered. And now that became a real barrier to getting them into homes in New England. And so there may be a specific thing that you all can work together to try to solve so that you can get back to the point of being able to do transports, um, but coming at it from a collaborative perspective. I love that, Lindsay. Um, I think, and I see a, another question further down, but I'll, I'll wait till Vincent gets to it, but um, they're similar. Um, when it comes to networking, at least from the source shelter perspective, um, Definitely, like Lindsay said, balancing, uh, making sure that you're really like scrutinizing all of your um, your your barriers in your in your uh, local adoption programs and foster programs and trying new local initiatives. Um, you know, if you're looking at you have limited resources and where you want to invest them, um, when you keep hitting a wall, when you're looking at at transfers, you know, shifting some of that energy and that attention into local options is definitely right. Um, when it comes just from a networking standpoint, um, I definitely, uh, this is just advice that I would have is not doing the big blanket emails. I know it takes time, but, you know, doing those, um, try to do some personalized reach out and I'm happy um, on the side to give you um, some cool things like on petfinder.com and some and some different ways that you can find groups out there um, and resources to, to connect with others, um, but offering uh, opening up and, and stating what you can offer. So um, give them a little bit of a background of your organization. And I will say, don't get discouraged if you get a lot of no's. Um, that will happen right now, especially coming out of the summer. Um, this is a really tough year, but asking if they would be willing to connect you, um, asking who they know. So a lot of that putting yourself out there and networking is a big piece of this. And um, I will plug that if, I know we're talking a lot of high level on this, webinar, um, but uh, there is a transport class or course that I'm teaching through uh, Maddie's University, and we uh, go really into detail about networking and finding new partners and uh, what to do if transport have stalled. So that's, um, you have to hurry to sign up though, the link's going to be in the chat because uh, the the shutoff date for uh, registration is in two days. So um, it's free, it's a four week course and it starts this fall. Um, so we definitely can dive into more detail about networking with partners um, if you all are interested in uh, the Maddie's class. All 
All right, a uh, quick question for you, Lindsay, um, from Wonder Dog Rescue. Um, is a rescue with a facility eligible to uh, for the HSUS capacity building mentorship? Yes, um, we don't have any restrictions on the kind of organization that applies. What we're looking for is an organization that has at least 12 months of available time and some uh, sustainability in your staff or volunteer base to uh, choose two to three organizations that you want to continue building relationships with. Um, so ideally, there's been a little bit of foundational work done on that already, and then the mentorship is really intended to to um, identify goals and to help you know build off of those relationships. Um, unfortunately, our mentorship applications uh, ended on Sunday. And so we are in the process of reviewing for 2024, but I'll share the link for our mentorships in the chat. And so please keep an eye out. Um, one of our goals with the mentorship program is to do really deep dives on these topics take what we are learning and then bring those to everybody else. So even if you don't get a full mentorship with HSUS, we're hoping to be completely transparent about the things that we're learning about what the organizations are still struggling with versus what they've really um, been successful with. And um, we bring a lot of that content to Animal Care Expo, but also in other ways. So um, hopefully it can be helpful to everybody. Right, next, thank you, Lindsay. Next audience question. Um, is from Sharon Pape, um, and I work in an area where transport is the only option for me. We do not have any shelters in our town. Most places are completely full and may not be an option dependent on the time of year. How do you deal with this? Um, so, yeah, that's that's a good question. And, and definitely, you know, um, when we talk about local options, and I've heard conversation about transport might not be around in 10 years, right? Um, that might be true for some organizations that do a really good job at um, keeping pets with their family and really increasing their return to owner rates. But for some areas like where Sharon's coming from, where there's just um, more animals coming in than there is actual, actual human population in some of these very rural areas, and we're very familiar with that living in Texas, um, you know, transport will most likely always be somewhat part of, of, of the formula there. So um, I would say networking is even more important and really tapping into some um, into some national resources and some regional partnerships. So happy to help make connections. I'm not sure where Sharon is, but hopefully she can uh, reach out to us or, or contact us and we're happy to make some connections and maybe give some ideas. But I think networking and getting connected is going to be the biggest help for um, some of our, our friends in rural shelters. Um, I've seen really strong coalitions and, and groups um, come together in rural areas because you know, um, just much stronger working together um, with limited resources. So happy to help, happy to help after the call. And um, another, the next audience question is from Bob Tubbs. Um, and this is a longer, I'm gonna read the question in because he wants your thoughts on his, on his uh, statement. Um, a regional transport coordinator, perhaps volunteer, can establish relationships with multiple rescues and shelters, perhaps HSUS funded. <clears throat> Lindsay, uh, this function could turn a one or two animal transport into multiple animals for two to three shelter rescue shelters, yeah, for or rescues. Once a transport is locked in, call surrounding shelters to see if they have room for other animals. I've turned one transport into multiples on a regular basis. What are your thoughts on this? So I think a lot of organizations, shelters, national organizations have talked about the need for some kind of solution. I, I think it's a technology solution that keeps the relationship between the sending and the receiving organizations, but really gets much more efficient. If I stop too long to think about how many vans and planes are moving from one part of the country to another without going a shorter distance, without 
filling that plane, without filling that van, it'll make my brain hurt. Um, and it's not anyone's fault. It's just that tr when transports originated and um, the programs originated initially, um, at least on a state by state situation up in New England and in, in the Northwest. And because there was no structure for this, our approach was like Google some places and then go get their animals and bring them up. And we all have sort of copied that model where now maybe the sending organizations are soliciting some help and you know someone's able to help and they happen to be in Oregon, even though there are places closer to you that could receive those animals. So I don't have a great answer for you, except that I think everyone agrees there's probably some kind of efficient <clears throat> solution that makes this work a little bit better. I don't know if it's a map if it's an app that helps everyone understand like where animals are moving. I know Best Friends had published that map about where sending and receiving organizations were. Um, and I don't disagree. I think there just needs to be, you know, a different level of coordination in all of this. Also, I don't have it in my budget, but thank you for, for <laughs> offering. <laughs> I think, um... Bob's doing a great job with uh, the lack of technology, and I can't agree with Lindsay more. The just the inefficient piece of this absolutely is uh, there is room for that um, for help in that area. One thing I would say is just from my perspective, and I've definitely felt, like personally have felt this that when it comes to transport, there is a level of competition, um, and it's almost like guarded. Like you don't want to share your partnerships, you don't want to like say names because you're worried someone else is going to swoop in and take your partner and <laughs> that sounded funny but uh take your transport partner um but I you know one of the things that I have been so thankful for is if I do have you know say a group uh, a state over that can you know and especially now they normally maybe they could take 20 dogs and this year they can only take five and that's really hard to send a, a, a whole transport van just for five dogs you know, I've been so thankful for them with their connections and their knowledge of their region to be able to tap uh, their partners and to say, hey, do you all want to go in on this transport together? And if you take two and they take three and, you know, and soon that's a full transport van. And so it's taken a lot of depending on a on a on the destination organization to be a little open with with their partnerships. Um, and then likewise, you know, on my side maybe teaming up with other source shelters and sharing sharing groups names a little bit more because just historically we've been very protective of our transport partnerships but when groups sometimes can only take two to five animals at a time you know I would rather share transports and work with multiple groups and have it go than uh to to not have it go at all because we're we're so siloed and, and protective of our partnership so I would just encourage everyone out there to try to loosen up that that competitive piece a little bit and and hopefully um are able to share you know transport names and and put some differences aside and, and work together um, I know that's not always easy um, but it certainly makes a difference when we can come together and pull a bunch of organizations together for one transport all right. All right. Next question is from an anonymous um, attendee. Thank you for this. What resources are available to small nonprofit rescues who pull animals from the shelter to try to help with overcrowding? And I'm assuming that's from a transport um, standpoint. Yeah, I, um, Claire, you you probably have a lot more examples of this, but I, I'm thinking about this shifting of the philosophy of transport where the, the destination shelter is, is really, uh, hearing holistically what the needs are from the sending community. And so if that's a small rescue organization that is pulling the animals from a local organization, but they aren't able to get the animals spayed or neutered, they might just be able to do the, the required vaccinations. Are there ways for the destination shelter to, you know, either ease up on some of the restrictions because they have the capability on their end, um, which has been tricky lately, as I mentioned. Um, but it's worth a conversation about, you know, how can you save some cost um, that the destination shelter can sort of take on? Um, and I think that works in some situations. Yeah, I would just echo that exactly. Just talking about cost sharing and 
Um, and, you know, I know it, in-kind supplies don't always help, but um, I know we've always had a need for kennels and some of our shelter partners have really needed pet food and bedding and things that are in excess in other organizations. And so just putting the needs out there um, and asking, I think there's no shame in asking for support and being transparent about where your needs are. Um, we've seen some really wonderful donations come through that way. And, and uh, especially for smaller organizations, it's made a huge difference to have you know, a few bags of food every month coming in, um, you know, never having to worry about towels or, or blankets or something like that, um, Kongs and toys. I mean, we've seen it all come through and that's made a huge difference, especially with these very small budget um, shelters and rescues out there. So given the two of you um, have are so heavily involved in transport, are there any what you would call maybe innovations or uh, things on the horizon when it comes to transport that you see uh, starting to emerge. You want to go first, Claire? Um, you can take it, Lindsay. I'll, I'll think a little bit about that. <laughs> um, I think what I have been seeing, especially from my region, is this uh, mentorship approach to transport. So um, an example would be the Massachusetts SPCA has a mentorship program uh, with South Carolina, where transport is a significant component of their work, but they also have sent their veterinary teams down to do travel to return clinics to teach, um, to work with the veterinarians in South Carolina on high volume spay neuter uh, processes. Um, and so they've, it's, it's similar to the capacity building mentorship approach where you're, you're exchanging information both ways about best practices and challenges. Um, it's just done, you know, from Massachusetts to South Carolina, which is a little bit more logistically difficult. Um, the ability for destination shelters to go and visit, as Claire mentioned, I think is really eye-opening, particularly, particularly for those of us who maybe live in communities where we have very different issues. It's not that we don't have any challenges. It's that our challenges are very different in uh, some communities. And so, Kind of, I've heard one shelter director say that while they wouldn't ever wish the challenges that they saw on the sending organization, it really reminded them of the bigger mission and why they got into this work to begin with. And so I think when we're siloed, we forget all of the other dynamics that are at play. So that relationship piece, the mentorship piece in both directions, I think is, is the innovation I'm seeing more and more. Yeah, absolutely. I would completely echo that. I think um, a deeper investment into source shelters, exactly what Lindsay said. Um, I'm excited that that's the future and we're seeing more of that um, because I really think that's that's going to be this. That's a more sustainable solution than just, you know, transport, unload, load, repeat, you know, over and over again without any other um, look into how we can support each other more. Um, you know, Absolutely. I think the learning both ways, I, I will say there is such a thing like the, the out of sight, out of mind. And I, I feel it too, you know, like it, there is something different when I come back from a shelter and I um, see those real challenges and I, you know, I'm touching the dogs and, and petting the cats and looking into their eyes. There's something about that, that when I get home, I'm fired up to figure out a, a solution and, and it drives um, creativity and innovation and, and some risk taking too. Like, let's try this pilot program. Let's try something different. Um, it gets you out of that comfort zone because you see the urgency and you're connected to it more. So um, that's excited me working with partners that have had a similar experience on the destination side. Um, and the, the other thing I would say is, you know, there is this thought that you have to be like highly resourced with a huge budget to be able to give back. And not every group is strong in every area. And one group, I remember talking to them um, and they felt that, you know, they, they said, we don't have a trainer. We really have a no behavior support program. Um, however, we have a lot of medical resources and we have uh, aligned to a couple funders that are really interested in our work in Texas. And so 
although they couldn't really take dogs that had known behavior challenges, um, they were able to do a lot on the medical front and also invest in spay neuter um, clinics in Texas and things that were really going to help the SOAR shelter and also secure some funding for these organizations that they're partnering with. So I thought, you know, even though they're a pretty small organization and don't even have, you know, any sort of behavior support on staff, they were able to help in a huge way because they played to their strengths and the resources that they have. So um, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to say, what, what do we have? What could we help with? And not really focus on what we don't have um, because, you know, we're never going to have it all. So uh, that, that's been what I've seen to be the future. And I'm, it makes me really optimistic and hopeful. All right. So um, as part of, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, about the need for technology, but, but how, how are you using either technology? I saw a comment from, from Bob Tubbs about social media. How are you, how, how are, are those um, methods useful in, you know, supporting a transport program? Yeah, I would say um, it's been very helpful when it comes to, uh, for people that do transport, definitely know all the logistics, like we mentioned, and sharing of medical records and keeping all of the details straight. Um, I am sad to say that I use a good old Google spreadsheet, live spreadsheet. I can't get away from it, but um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, my colleagues do too, and I think there's no harm in that. We don't have any fancy software that we're using to communicate to each other, but I think having some way of organizing is just so much easier. Um, organizing all the information and just focused on efficiency. Um, one of the things that I know from both a, a destination partner and a sending partner is when you get all that information up front versus in these scattered texts and screenshots and you know animal information and photos coming from all different sources, if you can put it in one um, very easy to view uh, either a spreadsheet or a Trello board or whatever it is, I know that makes the partnership just easier to all around. Um, it also decreases any chance of surprises. Um, you can also share videos of the dogs or the cats on there, um, different photos, all their medical records. So, um, I mean, we're very reliant on some pretty basic technology to be able to, to um, talk to each other and work with partners. But I think it's important as, um, as organized as we can be, because I know uh, on both perspectives, it just makes the whole uh, transport experience so much easier. Um, the last thing I'll say to that is the more organized you are and the more planned you are um, and uh, you have everything like ready to go when you're actually doing the transport. Um, that's so important having all your records in place because any delay and everyone knows this of like, who's this dog? And, you know, uh, where's that paperwork? That last minute means we've all been there, <laughs> but it means more stress on the animals because that could be delays. It's, you know, more time in transit. It's unnecessary stops and things. So um, I can't say it enough and I am not necessarily the most organized person, but when it comes to transport, I think organization is key. So um, the other thing I'll say, and this is a completely different other tangent, I know Lindsay mentioned um, the best friends transport connection map um, and pet finder. I'm happy to um, find the link for that too, has a great supply and demand map now, which is really interesting where you can, um, if you are a pet finder pro, you have to log into your pet finder pro account, but you can look and see where um, the volume of daily and weekly searches, adoption searches are happening around the country, as well as where um, animals are being marketed for adoption on pet finders. So I think that's really interesting to see um, you can compare, you can go from a state view to a city view, even down to the individual organization view. So I think it's a really cool tool. And um, I think it has a lot of potential to be able to help us connect with each other and just get a better understanding of supply and demand in general. So I will find, oh, perfect. Got it. Thank you for that, for that link. Already on top of it. All right, Lindsay, you... Well, I quit social media, so I'm not your best uh, expert on this. Uh, we are using Airtable at HSUS to try to put everything in one place because we are sending animals to our shelter and rescue partners. Um, but I couldn't agree more. Like the more organized you are, the less time that the destination shelter needs to spend on things that um, like paperwork, 
the more time that they can devote to the actual figuring out the kennels, doing the medical work, et cetera, getting them ready for adoption. All right, and I have one last audience question. Um, what do you find is the most important to do before transporting to a new partnership or rescue? Um, so for that, and this is, I've learned the hard way for sure, um, definitely an onboarding call in my opinion, just to make sure that, um, that you are aligned on, on all aspects of the partnership and it is a good fit and there is no shame and no trouble. If you get on a call and you start giving details of how you operate and what your needs are and how the destination partner operates and what their needs are. Um, and if both partners, it's just not a good fit that you don't have to force it. Um, and actually it's probably better that you don't because transport's a big deal and, and there's a lot involved. There's, high risk involved, you know, moving animals across the country sometimes. So um, I would just make sure that you ask questions and you really get to know that partner. Um, I'm happy to share, like I have like a sample, uh, like new partner question guide, just things that you are like, oh, that would have been nice to know, you know, before you started transporting. And those questions range from everything as basic as you know, um, the rate of disease in your shelter or how, you know, do you all have any behavior support or medical support on the, on the, on the receiving end? Um, you know, for the destination partner, I think it's really important for them to know the health and sort of, uh, of the animals and of the shelter that they're pulling from and, and some of the challenges that the Thor shelter has. So having those important conversations, uh, up front and having hopefully an MOU or, um, an agreement between the organizations is really helpful just to get it all out there from the beginning. Um, so you're just aligned with your expectations. That would be my advice. I haven't done that for every partnership and, um, there's been some challenges that have come out of that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with all of that. My dog just started dreaming and she's really loud. So if you can hear that, that's what's happening. Um, I also think that this siloed approach is because of the lack of those kinds of conversations historically. Um, when an organization gets burned in either direction, it does create this bad taste and this need to find, quote unquote, the perfect partner, which is like, it just is bringing me back to dating and I'm starting to twitch. Um, and so I think that these conversations visiting the organization at some point, you know, I, I don't like to go down the road of like worst case scenario, but some of our cruelty investigations have been, quote unquote, rescues in New England that well-meaning sending organizations thought they were sending to some bucolic New England organization. And so if you can't visit, asking around. So, you know, there's plenty of organizations near the organization you're you're trying to work with just to be like, hey, like, you know, what do you know about them? What's cool about them? What are their great programs? Um, you can do reference checks even if you are the organization that is sending and maybe especially because you're the organization sending. All right, and one, I will, let's send the, the audience off with this question. If you had one piece of advice uh, to organizations or individuals looking to start or improve their transport programs for maximum positive impact, what would it be? I love all these like pick one thing. I keep stopping because I'm like, I don't know what the one thing is. I'm going to say two things. One is just to be kind to each other, but there's a lot of competing priorities in animal welfare. And a destination organization's no does not mean they don't care about your community. It means they're trying to balance so many other things. And a sending organization's inability to meet your 27 transport requirements is not a reflection of their motivation to move animals. Um, and then second, I always like to remind people about cats. Um, these conversations tend to be very dog focused and according to Shelter Animals Count, cat transports have not declined. So maybe if you are an organization that has cats as well, that is a, a way to sort of build relationships now with organizations that might still have some openings for cats until they get back to a place where they, they can assist with dogs. I love that. Thank you for bringing up cats. I know it always, transport conversations always um, lean heavily on the dog side, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I would echo that being kind, um, looking at where you can uh, fill in the fill in the resource gaps and not duplicate efforts, you know, um, if 
I know it's hard because small dogs move quickly and sometimes that's what you can help with. But if you can give your partner a win with maybe a long stay larger dog that is bomb proof and in play group and is, is awesome, but you can, you can take that one large dog this time. I mean, give your, give a partner a win in that. Um, and then truly listening to each other and, and collaborating, I think is really important and strive to get past that transactional partnership. Uh, we've talked a lot about that this evening, but really see how you can, um, I know it's hard to say do more, do more when we're all so stretched, but thinking about ways that even just a little um, step towards that direction, like sending supplies down or, or some gesture in that way, um, picking up the phone and having a call when it's not just about transport and just checking in with your partner. Um, you know, I think those are all things that go a long way. All right. Well, so thank you. This is this is so excellent. Um, and um, I'm so excited that we were able to have you tonight. Um, so at this moment, we're going to have is are, are we having the survey? Yes, the survey is up. And thank you for tonight's webinar uh, for being involved in tonight's webinar panelists. But also, if we didn't get to your question, uh, please email us at webinars at AmericanPetsAlive.org. And as a reminder, tonight's webinar recording will be distributed within the next three days. Um, keep an eye out for our next event, which is September the 28th on the topic of heat mapping for your shelter data. Um, and my team is going to put that registration in the link. Um, and also keep an eye out for more uh, for. Uh, through your, your email, look for that email about that uh, webinar. So thank you all for being here tonight and I will see you again soon. Thanks Lindsay, everyone. Yes. Thank you everyone.